It's all right. No, I really appreciate everyone uh, participating in this experiment. Um, I would like to have to for temporal to facilitate deep conversations about workflows and long running stuff, whether or not it includes temporal, doesn't matter. We just want to make a place that people can talk about this stuff. Uh, and yeah, so, okay. Uh, Chris, I assume you're okay. Uh, so why don't we just kind of Thanks, go around the room and uh, yeah. Oh, you sound great. Oh, there's the podcaster. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, we could we could just go go around the room. I don't have to introduce myself. I'm just kind of like the uh, moderator, but uh, just go around the room and say like who you are, where you work, uh, and and then and then we'll kick it off. How's that? Um, Chris, you want to kick off? Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Toomey. I am co-host of the Bike Shed Podcast, which I think some of the content there uh, started this conversation. I'm also CTO of a startup called Sagewell Financial. And generally, I'm a web developer, primarily working in Ruby on Rails applications, but plenty of JavaScript and front-end libraries and all of that uh, throughout the years. So that's me. Including Svelte, which I, which I enjoy. Um, Including Svelte. Okay. And your, the reason we're meeting is because of one of your episodes, but we'll talk about this later on. I'll just get the intros out of the way. Max, you want to hit next, and then we'll go to Dave. Hi, hey, I'm Maxime Fatih. I'm CEO co-founder of Temporal. So I, I've been working... Uh, in this area of, of like workflow asynchronous communication for like probably the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> now I don't write that much code, but uh, I still kind of remember some of it. Excellent. All right, Dave. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Dave. Uh, Max has probably been working in this focused area much longer than I've even been working, but the, uh, yeah, my general background I've been working on Ruby and Rails applications, uh, typically uh, more on the back end layers for the last uh, 12 years or so. So some of them at larger scale, but now I'm working at a startup named uh, Release, uh, working on environments as a service type uh, you know, ephemeral environment uh, spin up creation. And, and yeah, I live in Portland, Oregon now. And that's kind of my bad. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and then Anthony. Yeah. Hey, I'm Anthony. Uh, I'm for the, for the last four years, I've been tech leading a team at that is responsible for orchestrating financial transactions within Coinbase, so everything that moves money in and out of the company and within the company, kind of flows through uh, our stack. Uh, before that, a lot of kind of bigger and smaller startups, not a lot of notable names, so kind of overall for about 15 years, kind of mostly Ruby on Rails, but recently a lot of Go and uh, uh, some, some Rust and some other languages. Okay, awesome. Yeah, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks so much for participating. Uh, basically, we we started nerding out in the chat, and I always want to capture these moments and share them because I think that more people in the community should come across them. And if in if it's hidden away inside Slack, people won't really find it. Um, so the reason I wanted to get people together was because we kicked off this discussion based on a podcast that Chris did or an episode that Chris had where he talks about this weird condition with Sidekick. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna recap what it is? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> and I'm also, it, it warms my heart to hear that the, some of the content on the show led to this oh sort of God. conversation, because we, yeah. we really try on the Bike Shed to tell the stories, like the, the nuanced, intricate details of day-to-day -day life of being a developer. And so really great to hear that that is actually leading to conversations out there in the world. Um, so the particular issue that we ran into was we have a system that is Ruby on Rails, and then we are using Sidekick, which as a data store, Sidekick is using a Redis instance. And so we had a user uh, make a transaction within the application. So they, they issued a change essentially, or they, they requested something to change within the application. We said, absolutely sure. And then in the background, we enqueued an email to send to them that is a notification of like, hey, we saw that you made that change. Don't worry, we're on it. But when the background job system attempted to process that email, it ran into an error and it said, hey, we don't, the data is not there. Like the, the object that you're referencing just doesn't exist in the database. And when I first saw this, uh, my heart jumped into my throat. I was like, wait, what? Because this is a very important uh, transaction that's happening within the system. And so the idea that the data just wasn't there, that we had this sort of data inconsistency was somewhat terrifying. But when I went to chase it down, the email had subsequently retried and sent correctly. So that was almost even weirder for a second. Like how did this fail initially and then succeed? Uh, but digging into it just a little bit, what we ended up seeing is the place in the application code where we attempt to actually make this change of data is wrapped in a database transaction. And we were also enqueuing the job to send that email notification within the transaction. 
So because Sidekick is so speedy, which is one of the features that we love about it, Sidekick was able to pick up that job and start attempting to send the email before the Postgres data transaction had closed. And therefore, when Sidekick's attempt to connect to the database tried to read that record, it wasn't there yet because of that was closed over in the transaction. And so this was interesting, but also once I saw the pieces like, oh, yep, that's exactly how those things work. And this is sort of one of the fundamentals of distributed, communi um, distributed computing where you're gonna run into this from day to day. And so thankfully we were able to solve it in a relatively straightforward and relatively complete way. There was a gem that we were able to bring into our Ruby application that essentially scanned for any operations happening in the context of a database transaction and would warn us not to do that essentially, it would fail our test suite essentially. Uh, so that was great, made it very simple to clean these up, but it was just sort of one more reminder that our Postgres primary data store and our Redis instance that Sidekick is running against are distributed. They are distinct uh, situations. So there is inherently some lag in the data that they see. There's also a lack of referential integrity, which I think is a really interesting one. Like if we were using a job queue that was backed by Postgres, then the entirety of the transaction, including the enqueuing of the job, would have been you know, part of that same data transaction within Postgres. But by virtue of distributing it across these two different data stores, we introduce this sort of failure mode. Obviously, there are tons of benefits that we get with it. We love Sidekick. But it was just one of those reminders of like, oh, well, yeah, everything's complicated, it turns out. I have a question. Uh, I just don't believe you resolved it. It looks like you probably reduced the uh, use am the am am amount of... Uh, possible risk conditions, but I doubt with you just uh, delaying something or checking something, you actually did resolve it. Uh, I like I like the uh, incredulity there. I think that's a fair take whenever I'm like, oh, I had a race condition. Don't worry, I solved it. It's fine now. Everything's going to be good moving forward. So the, the nature of the tool that we're using to solve it is a, a gem called Isolator. And its job is to scan the application for any work that you're doing within the context of a transaction. And then its suggestion is to use, to somehow move that out of the transaction. So you only wait until after the transaction properly executes to do things. And then there's an adjacent gem called after commit everywhere that allows you to wrap a particular block of code. So essentially create an anonymous function and say, please do this after we have successfully uh, completed. What, happens, what does happen if your process crashes just after committing transaction, but before this callback ran? Uh, so I believe the database transaction would not properly commit there and therefore we would not run the, uh, anonymous code block that we've created there. That's my guess, but I doubt unless you have to face commits, you cannot do that. And my, my point, my, my point right is I'm defer. pretty sure there is a risk condition there or you lose data. Like the only way you would solve it is exactly described. Uh, if you commit to the database, both message and the uh, update and uh, it's like usually called outbox pattern, right? When you commit things together, then you can kind of listen in the database uh, queue or whatever. That way you can do actually transactional commit. Any other way would require fancy things like uh, uh, two-phase commits and so on. I, uh, you're almost certain, well, I will say that you are definitely right. I think if I'm understanding it correctly, the failure mode that we saw where we attempted to process data but we didn't have it and so the job had to retry. We've now changed that for a potential failure mode where we will never send the email because exactly. there's a failure after the transaction commits, but then we fail to enqueue the job. Uh, and that is like, it, like you're saying, it's a trade-off and I'm intrigued by the more complete solution. Uh, so uh, I think that's why we're here today to chat about some of that, but I do believe we've shifted the error in that way and hopefully reduced the likelihood of it, but I'm not actually sure. Mm -hmm. I've got a question for you. Uh, I wonder if you know what was the reason for putting, uh, kind of enqueuing the second job into the tra database transaction in the first place. That seems like a really weird choice of um, kind of things to do because normally you would put something in a database transaction to make sure like it commits at the same time, but sending an email sounds like a like it's, it's a side effect of doing something within database. Like it's, they're not uh, inherently cu coupled. Uh, yes, that's definitely true. And one of the potential solutions is to just bring the calling code for enqueuing the job outside of the transaction. 
the reason that I was I went the solution uh, I chose with the after commit everywhere gem and with the isolator gem is this was an easy failure mode to get into. It was not obvious in the code. Basically, we're in a transaction because we're doing multiple different database operations, and we want those to have transactional consistency. And from a developer perspective, you're saying, okay, save the record, then save the other record with the association to that, save one more, and then tell the user that everything went fine. And it happens to be that that is all wrapped in a transaction. But if you're not looking sort of outside of the scope of the line that you're operating on, it's very easy to just introduce one of these failure modes. So now with the introduction of this linting, we have essentially created the same sort of, um, the same sort of flow where it's as if it's happening after the block, the transaction block. But we have that safety from someone accidentally introducing this in the future. But uh, I think uh, do, do your developers realize that they, they can potentially lose that message? Um, only in the very loose sense of well, we always know data might go away, but not in the not in the deep sense that I think you're asking the question. Oh, because not it's true. not like data going away. It's practically process crashing in the right moment will mean that you are in an inconsistent state. Uh, yes, with the exception, I, I think we try and approach our job queue as if uh, everything should be idempotent, retriable, et cetera. Those are hard ideas to really lock in on, but that is, I think, the idea that we have in the back of our head. We do have Redis persistence such that if we have a crash, ideally we could resurrect the, the job queue from that. But the idea that that is an ephemeral data store and the Postgres data store is the primary canonical source of truth, et cetera. But there is obviously an event record that's happening here that doesn't really exist beyond our log lines, I would say. And so the Redis being an ephemeral data store, Postgres being a primary, but there is the, the loss of that data in between. Um, and I've, I've looked at event sourcing systems and things like that as a way to provide more truth, uh, but I've not gone all the way to that level. I see. But it's interesting how you phrase it. It's pra you're practically saying Redis can lose data anyway, so we don't care about race condition that much because like, we can lose it anyway. <laughs> but uh, it certainly doesn't apply for a lot of business applications when you actually ca absolutely cannot get into the state when messages are lost. Uh, I, I, can, I doubt that Coinbase would be happy about such a solution. Um... Well, Chris wasn't happy because that's why he, he panicked when he found it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, but my Absolutely. point is that this solution is not a solution, right? Like it's a, it's still a bandaid, right? Yes, I think you're right about that. Uh, reality is there is no like I I tried like I I know this race condition very well. We actually in the first version of simple workflow we were doing the same thing, uh, and because it was using separate queue in a database, and we were kind of trying to do the same thing, and up, but we were putting message into the queue before, just not to lose it. But then uh, we had exactly that problem is that uh, message would be delivered before transaction is committed. And we had to deal with that in all sorts of ugly ways. That's why we moved to the outbox pattern in Temporal like in all other solutions, just because we want to make sure that uh, it's fully, uh, there is an actual real transaction when you can meet both. Does everyone here know what the outbox pattern is? Because I only came across it when he talks about it. Okay, <laughs> Max, you want to <laughs> explain a little bit? I can put it up on screen. <laughs> uh, sorry, what? What is the outbox pattern? So probably the idea is very simple, is that you have two tables in your database and, uh, and you just commit to, you probably do update of your whatever uh, database data you do, but you also commit the message itself as a part of a single transaction because it's just one database, or at least in one shard. And then you have separate uh, component which will pull that uh, outbox table for messages which are not delivered and will deliver them. So the nice thing about this approach is that if a transaction goes through, there is hard guarantee that both uh, update and the actual message in the separate table are committed. Or if transaction fails, both of them will not be there. So uh, it, you still, when you pull things out, they can be uh, delivered more than once for all sorts of failure scenarios. But the actual hard guarantee of transaction commit is very important. And uh, Amazon, for example, used this pattern like all over the place uh, since they like, 2000s, uh, like the beginning of 2000, because they used Oracle, like they, they built queue on top of Oracle, uh, which was doing exactly that. And that was used very extensively. Um, and then when in, in Temporal, when we started to design the system, we actually used that because we guarantee that uh, messages and timers and updates are always transactional using this pattern. Yeah, I'd say so, this on the, you know, real compelling reasons and arguments for when I started to look into temporal, obviously, is that Sidekick for a long time has sort of satisfied this sort of background job 
niche of, of processing and Ruby apps, but it's, you know, we never really had anything with that real strong reliability. Like everything's just sort of been best effort in terms of, uh, you know, tuning Redis or, you know, adding on the psychic pro features or something to get, uh, you know, a little bit better reliability guarantees out of it, but it's never really been like something that I could, you know, sit back and be like, oh, well, I've got absolute reliability in this system and like, I'm never going to lose any data. Like it's just been something you kind of live with in terms of uh, using Sidekick for uh, the background jobs and workflows and all that. So that's real. Um, is it possible to tack on an outbox pattern alongside Sidekick? Is that, I mean, it sounds like they might be, they might not be at conflict. I have one person shaking their head, one person. I, I don't know what Sidekick is. Is it, just, is it just an API or it's actually an implementation? It's both, yeah. Because think, technically you have the API which will integrate with your database transaction and with your database typing, right? So probably you will need to pass into that API call the actual transaction, transactional, like transaction itself, I don't know, is an object, right? And then uh, practically you will say, okay, update, then put message in using the same transactional object which you'll practically do insert in the same database and then you will commit to the transaction. But then you need to have separate component which will pull the database because it's just not putting stuff. You also need component which will pull the database efficiently and queues and databases are not very good uh, match, right? Like actually uh, Postgres is not that bad. You can implement queue relatively efficiently on top of that, but it's still probably not, not never will be as efficient as uh, Redis or whatever. I think that's something that Chris has mentioned in the episode. Uh, where he said, like, look, uh, it's probably better to use some like a you know, background job solution that is actually backed by Postgres or database, right, for this exact problem and not have like two distinct um, data stores to support it. I mm -hmm. think that might have uh, helped. Yep. But problem out of the box question is do you, uh, I don't know if there is anything uh, like standard in Ruby, which you could just use for that as a standard uh, solution. There are implementations that use a Postgres backed queue uh, for the four background jobs, but they're much smaller in sort of usage. And frankly, Sidekick has a ton of other features that allow for isolation and uh, and frankly scale in a number of things that Sidekick has become sort of the de facto standard within the the Ruby and Rails world. Um, but there are there's always trade offs, and there's an inherent nature of sort of decoupling there that that is really interesting. Um, there's a related question that I have around working with external systems. And so often we have, you know, we want to send a message over the wire and tell an external system to process some change. And then we want to record that internally and maybe even process to a third system after that. And those, I think, introduce a similar but slightly different version of the question of transactional consistency across distributed services. And one of the patterns that I've seen that's been useful is just item potency in those systems. So having a mechanism to indicate that this is the same logical operation to an external system such that the whole unit could be retriable. But I'm wondering, are, are there patterns, say does Temporal have any thinking around that where like we're now moving outside of the Temporal stack or outside of your application stack to a distributed system that may or may not fail or any of them in sequence may or may not fail. I'm just wondering what the thoughts are on that front. Oh. I don't know how much you know about the temporal, but on the surface, temporal is pretty simple. It gives you function which guaranteed to execute to the end and uh, in the presence of failures. Practically, if your function say, in, for example, your first example, you will have a function which updates a database, like we call it activity. Activity will update the database and they have second activity to send a message out. And temporal will not make those two transactional. It will be two separate uh, operations, but what it will guarantee that uh, if first operation uh, goes through, uh, then second will be executed no matter what in the presence of all sorts of failures. Practically, uh, it does it uh, like provides hard guarantees. Obviously, if you lose your database and like catastrophic things happen, uh, there are other ways to deal with that. But let's say your database is alive and temporal service is running, we do guarantee that this transaction will go through. And uh, then uh, you can do start doing compensations. For example, if you say operation A, A like, I don't know, <laughs> withdraw money, deposit money, right? Like you withdraw money and then deposit is not possible because of sort of business reason. Then you can run compensation saying put money back because you kind of can guarantee things like that they will proceed no matter what, then uh, uh, orchestrator can decide to do run compensations like in, in form of sagas or some all sort of other ways. That is the basic uh, guarantee it provides. It provides you practically, you write like three lines of code 
like withdraw deposit and then error handling, and it would kind of guarantee that this function executes no matter what. And uh, probably me, Anthony, can describe that in maybe more uh, like better terms than I do because I have too much context on that. <laughs> As someone uh, new newcomer to sort of thinking about temporal and how it fits and how it compares to Sidekick, which I've used for much longer. Uh, the way I am kind of picturing it is the activity level is sort of your typical Sidekick worker. Like those are your item potent classes and, and you know what you're going to execute that's retriable at all times and talks to external services and all that. And then that layer above is what it adds, which is this cool like workflow concept that's deterministic that, you know, it's always going to use that event sourcing pattern and like retrace through its steps and draw things off the, the history to sort of complete its work. And that completely obviates the need for things like rolling restarts and sidekick to like accomplish long running jobs. Like you get those uh, long running behaviors out of the workflow paradigm, which is the, the new concept on top of what you're familiar with probably is more the activity worker uh, unit of work. Yeah, Psyche is really focused on just kind of executing one job, right? And what I've seen kind of people do with that is you have one job that spawns like, you know, 10 other jobs, those like will spawn others. And that was quite common at Coinbase before we introduced Temporal. So I think it's actually, Psychic is really good at like doing one thing. And I don't think Temporal is a match for this because of the speed of execution and Psychic has pretty good guarantees as well. However, when it comes to you actually your business logic consisting of more than just one thing that you need to do this is where like something like a proper orchestrator like temporal really shines and it's almost like that right? it's not, like if you start looking at almost any real application it is a uh, very rarely just one thing it's almost always kind of things one thing leads to another which leads to another and i know the, about that sidekick support like durable timers uh, no, it's just it's just within one uh, running process, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it has really good guarantees around like if that process did not finish properly, it will restart it, it will retry things, but uh, no, it doesn't support timers. I see. So my, my other part is... we kind of temporal supports out of the box is like everything is protected by timeout. So if your operation is invoked and it didn't happen during time, it's guaranteed to be retried and guaranteed to return error back. Or like, or you can just say do something in a day. You can practically just say sleep for a day. And it will block on that line of code, and like one day later, it will continue executing from that line of code, uh, because we kind of guarantee that this this code will be uh, resurrected on a different machine if uh, like on its, when it's waiting for it, it's actually not in any machine, it's just in the database. But at the end, it, for you, it looks like this code just uh, waits there on that line of code. Um, the durable times make that possible, which is I think is very important for also the business process. Some of the conversation that we're having now is reminding me of phrasing that I've not explored too much, but I'm intrigued where we would fall on this of the at most once, at least once processing. And then like ideally exactly once being the magical in the middle, but technically infeasible in most cases. Although I've heard that Kafka with sort of that um, event log can be a way to approach it. But I'm wondering, does temporal, what would be the formal stance on that? And then under the hood, is it backed by an event queue system or an event uh, sourcing system like that? So it's interesting. Uh, Temporal kind of provides exactly once for the workflow function uh, because uh, in, in presence of failures, it will continue executing to the end. Uh, but activities, uh, it's usual thing because it provides at, uh, at most once guarantee for activity execution. So it will either execute once or it will get, workflow will get error back. Or by default, we actually have retry policy. So it should be at least once because it will just be, be retried multiple times. Yeah, but if you say, I don't want to retry that. Ones. So the big difference from like queuing systems that temporal say, if you say a maximum attempts one, it will be executed one or never. It will not like uh, by mistake ret retry it second times. But in this case, it makes sense because workflow will get timeout back or failure back, and then it can handle it or run compensation if necessary. Because uh, workflow code just invokes this activity, gets error back and say, okay, I don't know if it ran or not. I will run another activity, check the result of that, for example. But this is very rare. In 99% of cases, you just make them item point. The activities, workflow itself kind of is exactly what. Mm. Yeah, I typically say like we we have a system that is that to the outside is basically at least once, but we push that outside of the workflow logic into the activity logic, inclusive of retries. 
Um, and then the, the semantic of at most ones versus at least ones for inside of activities, it, it basically depends where you view uh, what the outside world sees. But essentially, like if, if anything fails, we, we, we try it. So it's at least once <laughs> in, in that respect for me. Um, and again, by default, you can disable, disable yes. that, right? Yeah, but yeah. again, the reality is that in 99.9% of cases, you want to add important activities always. I, yeah. yeah. There are very, very few use cases when you don't want to that. It's uh, very rare. In most cases, when some badly designed API out there, <laughs> good API should always have like, importance of talking in them. Uh, I think it's really useful to compare uh, temporal activities to actually psychic jobs because they're like, pretty much the same, right? It's just, it's where the actual logic happens. But the component that psychic is missing is like, it's this workflow, right? The script of what things in which order need to happen for your business logic to succeed, right? And um, cool thing about temporal is that if you are getting like persistent failures within an activity, you retried it, I don't know, like, you know, hundred times that didn't work. You can bubble up the error back to your workflow and process it somehow, right? Where with psychic is pretty impossible. Like you, you would normally just, you know, enqueue a psychic job and then hope for the best. Like there is no feedback mechanism to get, like to understand like what's happening with it. Well, there, there is psychic API, but I don't think like anyone's actually using it in the code, right? It's only to uh, to, to view it in UI and see like, oh, that uh, job has failed and this is the error. Like no one's actually like, parsing this and trying to, you know, unwind their business logic based on these failures. There is some functionality within Sidekick for understanding, like say all all retries are exhausted. It's a little bit ungainly of an API, uh, but it is part of the the job API. That said, what you're describing of having an orchestration layer, understanding how multiple jobs work together, need to happen in a sequence, that is definitely something that I've struggled with in the past. Right now, the application that I'm working on doesn't have as much sort of orchestration or workflow, but I agree with the idea that like you just wait, you'll you'll see it, it'll come. Uh, so I, I understand that I felt this pain before. I am sure I'm going to feel it in the near term. Um, but for right now, you know, this this particular error I ran into is slightly more scoped. But these ideas, more generally, definitely uh, all feel true and feel like they're they're coming at me fast. Yeah, there's a really important component to that as well, right? If you have something that will, I don't know, retry indefinitely, that gives you enough room to spot the failure, fix it deploy it and get it to run successfully, right? This is something that we kind of underestimated, I think, when we switched to Temporal, but then we realized, oh, we just need to crank up the, the retry logic, right? Like it's sometimes you can be like super clever and try to, you know, figure out what these failures are and process them. But every now and then you will just get hit with something that you didn't um, kind of expect. And I think in this case, it's actually just better to leave it trying until someone goes and fixes. This is actually what people are not used to because everybody wants oh retry three times, retry it for 10 minutes. And like when you say retry forever until you fix the bug, uh, it's something which people are not used to. But it's actually pretty powerful because you can fix because you see because uh, people are used to intermittent problems. But in workflow scope, intermittent problem can be three days. Because if your workflow takes three months and it was something was done for three days, it's still an intermittent problem. It, which can be fixed by, and also it's a real problem can be fixed by deployment or by users actually fixing code, which is absolutely not something people are used to. Yeah, um, I, I, I struggle with that sometimes because a lot of people don't have problems that last for days and, and months, but those people that do, uh, we are clear, we're clear sell for them. Um, well, I wanted to get something about sagas because Maxime actually was, was kind of laying you up, Anthony, for talking about saga stuff. Um, is there any advice that you want to give like people or Chris in, in particular, like when you're thinking about sagas and compensation? Absolutely. I think it's a really powerful pattern uh, that worked really well for us. So most of our financial transactions are actually based on the distributed sagas pattern. So the idea is pretty simple, right? You take your workflow, you construct that as a DAG, so directed acyclic graph that has like a clear beginning and a clear end. And then you go and execute it. You can have things happening in parallel. You can have things waiting on other things to happen before it can uh, proceed, but everything is kind of sequential. But kind of when something fails, what you do is you basically take all the arrows in that graph and you reverse it to point backwards. And now you execute that graph going backwards from the step that failed, performing compensating actions. So now you're undoing the effects 
that happened in the first place, right? It's a really interesting concept, but like some people will think, oh, you know, when I need to undo something, I just need to erase it from the database or something. But if you're dealing with financial transactions, you actually can't do that. You need to like for every debit, you need to apply credit to compensate for it, right? And vice versa. So uh, some some actions, of course, would be just like remove it, and because you don't care, those percent never happened. But um, the idea here is that you just define a compensation for every step that you have within your workflow, and then you execute backwards, compensating for the things that happened so far. That uh, helps you deal with a lot of things that are just unpredictable. With like failures can happen along the way. And sometimes it's just better to get back to safety without being too, you know, um, stay, staying there, trying, retrying forever. I will say that that definitely sounds very intriguing and like it, it offers sort of a, a direction towards correctness that, um, that certainly calls to me, although immediately I start to have some questions in my mind of uh, what if the correction, the corrective action fails? And so what you get into a weird state, and I can imagine that actually being pretty easy to get into, like with database transactions in Rails and probably many other ORMs, you often write the up transaction and then the, the down. And the down doesn't happen that much, actually. And I have found plenty of cases where we thought we had a sufficiently reversible migration. Turns out we did not. And now we're in this uniquely bad situation where the fallback plan doesn't work because it's not tested. It doesn't get used that much. So um, it sounds the way you're describing it like this has actually been a really great thing. And the idea of having to write the compensating action for everything, that also sounds sort of uh, burdensome is too strong of a word. But like I see developers who are like, I don't want to write tests. I don't need those. I certainly am a fan of tests and having as many of them as possible, but I can see how it's like, that feels like extra work. And particularly if you're not actually using the compensating action that often, if the, this is a very happy path uh, workflow that mostly succeeds. Um, I guess I'm, I'm saying a lot of things here, but like this feels like something that might be easy to get wrong. feels like something that developers might actually resist a little bit because it feels like extra work, but it sounds like you're very happy with it. So I'm, I'm intrigued as to where I'm misaligned in some aspects of that. Suspect. I think it's all about guarantees, right? It's it's about kind of what what guarantees do you want to get from your system, right? If what, what you're describing might be that developers don't really care because the business doesn't doesn't care, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe like you like it's fine to leave things where where they are, and maybe that's happening. I don't know. Maybe the you don't have a lot of load. Maybe these errors happen like I don't know once a month, and it's fine to have like a developer you know open up a console in production and just fix it, right? So we 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 all done that. I think that's a that's a viable solution to <laughs> these these issues. However, when you start experiencing these like at, on on a scale of like you know thousands a day, right? This is where you need to have an automated solution, and I think this is where it becomes really powerful. For us personally, we we test every single workflow that has this pattern to fail on every single step, and make sure like it always rolls rolls back. So like yes, we do have like really extensive tests. For these, but I think that worked really well. And I don't think people actually consider them to be like very burdensome. I think, yeah, once once you get into kind of this, you know, habit of doing this, it's not that big of a, you know, overhead. I think item potency is one of those ideas that when you first hear about it, you're like, oh, that feels like it's going to be a lot of work. And then when you start embracing that idea, you, you see the power of it, you see the utility, and then you learn the patterns around it. So I can see the way that folks would would quickly adapt to this. Um, do you find that there are that much sneaks through where something is not as reversible as you hoped it was, or is that really based on the way that you're testing, the way that you're building these, and the the skills that your team has built, that this is a pretty easy thing to maintain? Most things are reversible. I don't think like we had. Yeah, there there, there might be like a timing component where you know reversing something might be too late now to do right, and we would have some like guards to check against that and make sure like you don't actually blindly compensate for it. But normally most of the things would have like a natural compensation that you would do. One, one example that doesn't have compensation is like sending an email, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's <laughs> you can't take it back. One. You can so send an apology, apology email. <laughs> apology email. <laughs> well, that's um, also an area where retries can be dangerous if not handled correctly. One, one thing about the saga, which I think I found recently is that uh, you still can retry things. It's just that, uh, for example, you make operation A, B, C, you run operation A and B fails. And if, then you want to figure out if it's like a retry, like intermittent error or not. 
if like you've got some uh, intermittent error, you probably want to retry a few times. And then uh, only if you get some sort of business level business level error, for example, like uh, money, okay, not enough money on your account. Uh, in this case, probably you want to roll back and then uh, roll back is practically running the compensations. Uh, so uh, I've seen people asking like, should I even have retry policy? Absolutely, if it's intermittent error, aborting the whole thing just because like network connection went down for two seconds, you don't want to do that. But it's your business, you need to decide. For, for how long you retry, can you fix that or you want to abort that? And the other interesting thing is that uh, Anthony said that their framework based on DAC. Uh, like, technically, there is no reason to do that. Uh, it's uh, just one way to do that. For example, uh, in Temporal, you can just, um, in, in Java, we have a very simple class. You just add compensations there explicitly. You practice say run operation A, add compensation for A, and just put a lot, a lot practically a closure there. And then like run B, add compensation for B, Put the closure there, and then at the end you just say if an error happens, you say compensate, which goes through those closures and works them one by one. Uh, nice thing about that approach is that if you have complex branching logic, because uh, the hard part about DAX is that if you have complex branching logic, you can take a lot of paths, and uh, uh, and what it happens is that in this case uh, the compensation flow can be complicated, and uh, if you have this dynamic one, like if something do this operation, then you can add compensation uh, dynamically based on the actual path you took, especially of course in some those like kind of more complex library, which does a lot of stuff. You don't even know what's there. And this approach of the, adding them dynamically allows you practically to create a list of compensations dynamically and then reverse them when necessary. And I think this is big, a big difference from a lot of like static solutions, which kind of pre-configure all your paths in your system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks like um, Anthony has some examples. Oh, this is in the SDK? Oh, what is this? You want to explain this while I put it up on screen? Yeah, this is this is an example of using distributed sagas with temporal uh, in Ruby. And this is- Amazing. Oh, wow. that is a, exactly what I said, yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think like the traditional distributed sagas approach is using DAG and you can use DAG, but this is like a, a simple version of that where you know things just happen linearly yeah this is the example i was using to uh get buy-in from my colleagues and sort of present temporal and just you know it was definitely the most like complete complex uh, example that i could kind of compare with what the equivalent sidekick way of thinking about things would be and, and showcase all the steps so that's dave for your use cases releases right like what is compensation look like there um, we haven't gotten into concrete implementation yet for me to be able to speak to okay. about how Saga specifically or compensation would work. Um, I think it's probably less about this because most of what we would be doing would the big, the big benefit for us would be sort of visualizing that overall potentially dynamic, uh, workflow building, uh, pipeline that a customer might want to have like a very flexible workflow that they can construct and then have that sort of listed out and like uh, think of like the tasks and build kite or similar system where you can kind of just like see the sequence through the build as it's going through it. Um, so a lot of it's going to be, you know, not reaching out to external services as much things that are less likely to fail or less likely to be important about rewinding, I think, as opposed to the financial context that Anthony deals with it. Uh, uh, yeah, or, or cryptocurrency failure, which is uh, which takes a while. Uh. Yeah, just so, <laughs> like, like being able to visualize and you know, have dynamic workflows built out of this uh, sequence of steps that uh, knows how to bubble up failures and be done in a consistent way. That's kind of a big draw for us at the moment in terms of switching over from a more like uh, homegrown sequence of sidekick workers that transition database state and just sort of need to handle their own uh, state progression. So that's kind of what we're trying to avoid by switching over to temporal earlier on in the, in the process of building our architecture. Cool. Cool. Got it. Um, okay. Um, hey, this is, this has been an excellent discussion. I wanted to uh, take some time to ask for any um, relevant resources that you, you guys have, that you recommend to people uh, or any sort of features that you want to shout out in, in Sidekick or in Temporal that you, that you think have been very helpful to you or interesting that you want to refer to? Like just basically the, the further reading. Yeah, so 
with sidekick specifically, I think uh, kind of why I was drawn to this thread and discussion about it is I've always thought that you know, sidekick does a great job of becoming quick up and running. Like, you know, you can get people a pretty good, uh, you know, notion of background job processing and, and that goes a long way in terms of it pretty much leverages all the rails environment code base like a lot of people already have redis stood up for caching infrastructure so they just kind of piggyback on existing infrastructure and it's easy to get going but there's just so many things like this you know that rails also encourages sort of bad usages of sidekick like you know the active record after create is kind of the the big place where you can get into problems with transactional stuff because after creates actually called before the transaction is closed so if you're queuing stuff up from your active record callback, you need to make sure you're using it after commit in terms of you know, getting away from that. Um, so in terms of just like further reading on sidekick usage patterns, uh, I would typically draw some inspiration from like GitLab has like a pretty uh, extensive style guide for a bunch of their technology choices. Um, and being a big Ruby mono repo, they've got stuff for, this, for GraphQL or Sidekick. So I would kind of go there first as far as like what larger companies and larger teams uh, encourage as far as Sidekick best practices and, and the way that they've extended it and, and do certain things like specific queues for certain job types or being able to like send CPU or memory bound workers over to the specific uh, scheduling stuff that they've extended uh there is one that i've seen which is uh in addition to the isolator and after commit everywhere gems which i'm now using in the context of sidekick but obviously have some of the complexities that we're talking about there is an implementation called good underscore job uh, so this is by ben sheldon and this is a postgres backed um alternative to sidekick in the ruby on rails world and it has some good conversation in both the readme and then there's an associated blog post that talk about some of the trade-offs inherent to using a system like Sidekick and having that be in a distributed data store like Redis and questioning like, do we actually need that? Could we get by using Postgres? What are the trade-offs? What do we get? What do we trade, et cetera? So that's, I, I found that to be a really interesting um, exploration of the area. And as a potential alternative to Sidekick, it's one that, that did catch my eye there. Awesome, awesome. Um, I always leave, leave, love leaving breadcrumbs. Um, Anthony? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention the kind of the talk that got me into distributed sagas and kind of that pattern. Uh, I think it's it's by Katie McCaffrey. It's from like seven years ago on a, one of the go-to conferences. Um, yeah, I think that this is what got me into, and this is like, this has like really good description of how the pattern works. What are the, some of the underlying problems with it? Uh, what sort of issues it solves? I think, yeah, if you are into that, it's definitely worth checking out. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. And, and then I think for us, for uh, Max, it's probably his talk slash blog post, right? Which you, you presented at the Facebook conference. Um, anything else that you want to? No, I think I talk about that and we probably, uh, it links out box pattern, which I mentioned, which probably worth uh, just checking. Nothing special there, but it's at least worth knowing about it, it, how it's called. Because <laughs> I actually yes. didn't know how it's called until like this year, I think. We, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I liked uh, I did like that uh, the Amazon Builders library um, has a something about like uh, retries and, and fallbacks and how Amazon doesn't write fallbacks. Oh God, Google is down. Um, and so I, I thought I thought this was also a very interesting article for me, and we discussed it internally as well. Um, okay, so yeah, um, thanks for thanks for participating in this like really experimental uh, podcast slash uh, group discussion. Um, hopefully we can have more discussions like this from our community whenever there's something interesting and relevant popping up and then we can share experience. So thanks guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop recording now. Um, and yeah, if, if hopefully that was, that was okay for you as well. Um, and uh, I know it's a little bit awkward, but hopefully this is like the start of something that could become a temporal podcast or distributed assistance podcast, whatever we call it. I don't really care. I just want to have good discussions. This was great. I'm coming away with a lot of reading and thinking to do so. Uh, on the one hand, thank you. On the other hand, ah, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome to join our Slack, uh, Chris. Like it's it's a it's a community Slack. You can discuss with Dave and Anthony and the rest of us here. Thanks for the thing, Tom.
thanks for having me. I think that was really useful. I got quite a lot of notes. I'll also kind of follow up on them. <laughs>